Good afternoon and welcome to this month's uh, Dean's Research Seminar. Um, before we begin, begin today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm on, which is the Boon people. And these are the traditional owners of um, the lands here on Bayside. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land you're on and where you're situated and acknowledge that Indigenous Australians have been custodians of the lands and waterways of Australia for thousands of years. And I pay my respects to the elders past and present. Today, Professor Prem Bala from the School of Agriculture and Food will present the Dean's lecture, Dean's research seminar, um, Developing Crops for Future Climates. Professor Bala earned her PhD from Punjab Agricultural University and then worked as a research associate at the Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York. She then spent eight years as a team leader in biotechnology with ICI Australia before rejoining academia at Melbourne University in 1994 where she promptly won an ARC Research Fellowship in the Faculty of Science. Prem progressed to be full professor at the University of Melbourne in 2006. She sat on many school faculty and university committees over the years, including the India Strategy Working Group, the STEM M Precinct and Life Sciences Hub Task Force, and she was chair of the Academic Board Selection Committee in Medicine. She was the Melbourne Node Director of an ARC Centre of Excellence for Integrative Legume Research, and has been a member of the ARC College of Experts and was Associate Dean for Research in the Melbourne School of Land and Environment, a forerunner of this faculty. Most recently, Prem sat on the New Zealand Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment College of Assessors. In her career to date, here at the University of Melbourne, Prem has received $26 million as a Chief Investigator um, for her research. Perhaps of the notable things that she's done, she developed the world's hypoallergenic grass, which led to the discovery of a genetic switch that can be turned on or off to alter the development of male gametic cells, bringing the understanding of plant reproduction to a whole new level. And Prem has more than 150 internationally refereed research papers, and many of these have been published in prestigious journals. And over the years, she's trained 24 postgraduate students and 12 postdocs. Her research has focused on discovering new knowledge that has strategic and applied applications in the areas of plant reproduction, cell and tissue culture, genetic engineering, and the functional genomics of crop plants. Her current research is focused on developing climate change ready crop plants that can sustain normal reproduction and seed under drought and heat stress conditions. Um, please welcome Professor Prem Bala. Prem, over to you. Thank you very much, John. I um, appreciate it, your introduction, and welcome, everyone. Um, and just everyone can see my screen. Yeah, Prem, it's perfect. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, welcome, everyone, and thank you very much for taking time to, uh, to come to uh, talk. Um, and and I'll start by just uh, um, making people aware of that um, all our food comes from crops or crop plants, and uh, it is result of plant reproduction. Uh, what um, we eat, grains, fruit, vegetables, this is all as the end result of successful plant reproduction. Uh, so, but uh, we have a challenge um, uh, ahead of us, uh, as most of you are aware of, um, that population is going to grow uh, substantially, and we need to produce food, um, sub um, more food, um, which we never did in our whole human history. Um, um, and we have to do in the same amount of land. So challenge is quite big, um, and uh, but we have to meet that challenge. On top of this challenge, we have also uncertain weather conditions. Uh, as you are aware of 2019 here and around the world, we had lots of fire, lot of drought, and then we get a lot of water as well, and which caused a lot of damage last year in Northern Hemisphere, as well as close to home in Australia. So um, it's now well established that uh, uh, climate change um, going to impact uh, 
our agriculture production. And this is the graph uh, showing you uh, that most uh, that most of part of the world will be affected one way or another uh, due to these unpredictable conditions. And um, by in some area, the production can affect more than 25%. Uh, and uh, uh, more uh, in addition to that, we also uh, have predicted or people who does the uh, modeling work uh, that four major crops which we grow around the world maize, rice, soybean, wheat, that due to their production will be affected due to their year to year variation in the climate change. So uh, that's a quite a reduction um, uh, can be due to the unpredictability of the weather. Uh, this is just to put you in perspective of um, these four major crops which uh, we use around the world um, uh, projected um, production in relation to the population growth in 2050. And the solid line shows you that what we need to produce and the dotted line tells you what is the predicted trends are for these crops. So there is a already very big gap um, in the production of major stable, stable food or stable crops around the world. So that's here we I will introduce you our laboratory. Um, at our faculty, where uh, we are trying to use new technology to address some of these uh, challenges um, in front of us. Um, so there are a number of uh, crops which we focus on. Um, uh, um, uh, coconola, uh, brassica, uh, different kinds of brassicas. We, worked, uh, we are working in our laboratory because the brassica canola is the major crop um, in Australia, we also uh, work, works on wheat, rice, and they are the major staple crops around the world, and soybean and grasses and some horticultural crops. These are the programs um, which we, un which we uh, are undertaking um, in our group, um, and we have a number of programs. The major programs, as, as John um, mentioned, is on abiotic and biotic stress, uh, tolerance of the crop plants, which we develop as a joint with Australia-India collaboration. Uh, and um, we're taking that further. But uh, so, but today, um, and we have also a number of um, discovery, uh, discovery project with an applied meaning to it. Um, um, like, and I will be today discussing more on these, uh, these areas of our accomplishments. Um, uh, obvious, um, and uh, we will leave um, this part for some other time. Um, so first, um, just to a uh, little bit people who are not aware of that how, um, as I mentioned, all our grains, uh, all our grains, our food production is as a result of fertilization or successful plant production. And how, uh, to refresh your memory, how this happens, uh, uh, the pollen is the male part uh, from the anther organ has to find its way to land on the receptive stigma, which it germinates and to produce a pollen tube and finds the egg, egg ovule, um, egg cell in the ovule. So, but in, in plant, there are, uh, things are complicated. They are not as straightforward as in animals. In plants, we have two sperm cells, uh, not one. And then we have a vegetative nucleus which guides the pollen tube. And one sperm cell fuses with egg to produce embryo. Another, cell, uh, another sperm cell fuses with the central cell to make actually the endosperm, the things which in the grain we eat. So this, uh, process is called double fertilization. So we need double fertilization to successfully produce rice, wheat, soybean, all, uh, all the stuff which we eat. So also in, in, uh, in case of uh, uh, plants, the things, how these things are formed are different. Unlike in animals where um, um, most of uh, our germ cell 
are set aside during early stage of the development. But in case of the plants, the plants uh, after fertilization, um, they go through a vegetative growth period. Then suddenly plant decide to go into the flowering mode. And during the flowering mode, the reproductive organ formation happens. And after the reproductive organ formation, the gamete development happens. The gamete development means um, egg cell and sperm cell formation. So in case of plants, so we, uh, the gametes form from somatic cells, unlike in the animals, which are germ cell lineage is set aside very early in the development. So in our lab, uh, we ask our research question, how this process happens? Because our understanding of first, how suddenly a cell uh, decided to become from somatic cell to germ cell, and that was the big question our lab, uh, we, we were interested to, uh, to answer. Because if we understand how the gametes are formed, how the fertilization happens, then we can produce more food. So this is a um, uh, um, flower of lily showing you the male reproductive organ where the pollen formation, pollen is the male organ not the gamete itself happens. And this is the diagrammatic representation of the section of the anther. So pollen dwells from a cells, which are somatic cells um, called microspore mother cells or microsporocytes, and they undergo meiosis to produce tetrads. Uh, I want you to remember this because we will come, I will show you some pollen photo on this stage of the development. And this is the stage when 2N becomes 1N and microspore still is not a gametic cell. Still it goes to after uh, it's some development, it goes through asymmetric division where now the germ cell lineage forms. So our lab um, was, we isolated a gene which we showed the development of this lineage. As you will see, this is in situ localization of the asymmetric division has happened. And this nucleus is falling, uh, separating uh, from each other and the germ, germ cell, uh, genetic cell formation is, is, uh, is happening. So this was very fundamentally a discovery because before our publication, um, or before we published this result, the fundamental thinking was that these are, these are the two nuclei, they are not the cell. So we demonstrated that they, it is an independent cell and which is transcriptionally active. And this cell goes, uh, a genetic cell goes to divide again, another mitotic division to form two sperm cells, which we saw in my previous slide performing fertilization. So this, um, uh, from this, we uh, change the textbooks uh, saying that this is not a nucleus. This is an independent cell, which is capable of determining its, uh, its fate itself. So we were intrigued to find, um, so what is controlling uh, uh, such expression? So we isolated the promoter and uh, of this gene uh, and uh, demonstrated that this, gene is active in other plant tissue. This is a rice uh, pollen showing the expression of LGC gene because this gene was isolated from lily. So that's why we named it LGC lily genetic cell number one clone we picked up. So we wanted to understand a little bit more that why it is specific, how this cell within cell situation now we have, how it can be that independent to each other. Um, so we uh, uh, started learning more about the promoter, five prime reason, which controls the gene activity. And uh, with the, some deletion experiment, we can demonstrate that if we remove uh, some portion, 50 nucleotide from prime, prime end of this gene, and this gene suddenly become, uh, loses its specificity. specificity. So this is the expression in genetic cell and it can become expressed everywhere in the cells. So we call this 
want as a silencing reason, and we then wanted to demonstrate whether such phenomenon exists in other, other plants. So this, uh, we, for this, we strategically pick some plants to demonstrate magnolia is a, a basal angiosperm very early in the evolution. And uh, we demonstrated in P. brassica that this kind of phenomenon exists in, is, is, is conserved in, in the plant. So we, uh, so we, this is very clear that there is a silencing element in the generative cells, in the germ cells, which gets silenced in all the vegetative cell of the plant, but it becomes activated in the only germ cells. So we uh, cloned uh, this repressor, which makes it um, repressed in, in the generative cell. And, uh, uh, and here we isolated this repressor and uh, ask the question, and if this repressor should be present in all the somatic lineage, but it should be not be present in the generative cell lineage. So here is the immunolocalization showing that it is uh, present in the vegetative nucleus, which I showed you, and this generative cell does not contain this repressor. So on that basis, we did postulate or demonstrate that it's the transcriptional repressions um, which um, controls the formation of the gamete from the somatic cell to the, uh, to the gametic cells. So now um, I will a little bit talk about the translation uh, of this research um, that when we just study plant production, especially male plant reproduction, you will ask me, what, how would you translate your research to something meaningful? Um, so I want to introduce here hybrid seed, concept of hybrid seed production. Of course, we want, as I mentioned, we want to have more uh, crop yield uh, uh, without much associated cost. So that is a concept of hybrid seeds. Hybrids are formed, as we know, when two genetically distance uh, um, we cross two genetically distant um, plants and we get a product which is much better than the parents. Here is the uh, um, uh, um, demonstration um, um, with regard to corn plant uh, or maize plant that when you have a self, self maize plant, you will get um, uh, your cob and here is the selfing when the male parent and when we and uh, when we cross between those two plants and we get a better uh, looking corn or bigger corn cob and when we uh, grow seeds from this here are the the results because the hybrid is plants are much more vigorous and more productive um, than the parents itself so this is called hybrid bigger. This concept has been utilized extensively in case of corn crop. Uh, here is the data from 1950 to 2010, uh, showing that due to the hybrid production, the corn production, hybrid seed production on hybrid bigger exploitation, that the production of corn has increased substantially during last uh, 100 years or what, so years. So, in case of uh, corn, corn is a very easy uh, to make hybrid in, in a sense because male part is on the top, female part where we harvest the cobs are, are separated uh, from each other. So the practice is uh, that farmer grows, uh, the, the farmers grows corn crop, they go and chop the heads off on the top and they collect and they convert this plant as a female parent and you, uh, and you harvest uh, corn from the female parents, which is a hybrid corn. So the plant is geared uh, towards that which can be easily manageable. But what about when the flower, but most of the crop plants, the flower has both male and female part together. So how, how then we can achieve uh, uh, this hybrid vigor or control. Hybrid vigor is exploited by controlling uh, pollination process by making one of the parent male sterile so that we can harvest seed from the female parents. 
So with that uh, concept, we um, collaborated with a company called Henderson Seed, um, which is an Australian company. And this is a, uh, their field, uh, uh, field site um, in the Eastern suburbs of Melbourne. So this company works on the vegetate, uh, uh, they, they specialize on vegetable uh, crops like brassica, cauliflower, broccoli, um, uh, and, uh, and other uh, vegetable crops. So they export um, these seeds, hybrid seeds, uh, to overseas, and these hybrid seeds uh, catch the premium price, one kilo of cauliflower seed, used to, uh, to sell more than 8,000 US dollars. So they, what they do, and this is the flowering cauliflower plant. Um, as you see, the flowers are very small and they are in bunches. And so they, they use a lot of manual labor during the flowering season uh, to each, from the each plant, they, they, they emasculate the anthers so that the some lines are getting uh, one rose is getting converted into female line and they get fertilized from the male and they harvest those seeds. So uh, after spending so much money, still when I spoken to um, uh, uh, our industry partner and they say they still get more than 20% higher yield and 20% more profit from the hybrid, hybrid crops uh, without any associated cost attached to it. And the crop they generate is more uniform in maturity and the fruit size and color is more uniform because customer wants more, um, uh, the fruit should look the same and should look attractive and should be nutritious as well. So we um, have a couple of, ARC linkage grants with Henderson Seeds, where we use our discovery of another gene, which we picked, which we isolated, we call it BCP gene, which is specifically expressed at the early stages of pollen development. And we use, uh, we developed technology, genetic transformation technology, um, using their commercial cultivars. Um, there's no use of demonstrating a technology in a model variety or a model plant because the industry want that uh, the, uh, their germplasm should be converted so that they can use that germplasm in their breeding programs. Um, so we developed uh, genetic transformation technology for their commercial cultivar. And here is one example of, the, of one of their lines, uh, cauliflower flowering after genetic transformation. and. Uh, this is when we looked at the pollen from this lines, these are the, we stopped the pollen development at the tetrad stage of pollen development. And this is your, how the normal pollen, uh, viable pollen looks like. And uh, here is the plant uh, showing the hybrid vigor or uh, making the hybrid seed production in this um, thing. And we did get um, good papers out of, uh, out of these linkages grant. And the other important uh, bit about this is the hybrid. When they export these hybrid seeds, they have to produce a certificate that they are pure. So when they do ma uh, manual uh, dissection of the anthers from the flower, the contamination have been very hard uh, for them to manage. Uh, so by this um, uh, genetic means was we were getting the much purer hybrid seed for export market. Um, so now I just want to a little bit to demonstrate as I read the instruction that it is to get to tell people what um, um, uh, what a different technology exists in, um, in our faculty. So I thought I should include um, our breakthrough technology which we developed for the macadamia. As you all know, probably know that macadamia is not a native to Hawaii, which most of people think macadamia is the only Australian native commercialized crop. And it's uh, very good for human health, as you probably all know as well, and macadamia oil is sells as the premium price. But now in this case, it's a tree. Tree takes long time to develop and produce fruit. And uh, macadamia tree is an open pollinated crop. So what does it mean? That when the farmers or the industry wants to, uh, to propagate or put more trees, they like to use the tree, which they think is 
uh, is good for the quality of their nuts. But so the, uh, the problem has been in the industry that they cannot multiply when they identify a tree. Being an open pollinated, the progeny will be different, but they want to multiply it, the tree which they most, some of the trees which they identify is good for the food, uh, for the nut production. So we um, develop and, and uh, I should mention that uh, the, uh, the uh, industry usually use cuttings to, uh, to propagate and cuttings have not been very successful. So we, uh, we talked to um, Macdemia Council and Horticulture Australia where we uh, um, develop a technology that we can take a piece of tissue and culture in petri dish and we can produce lots of shoots uh, from a small amount of uh, the tissue and we can grow whole whole plant. This is again is a commercial cultivar which uh, industry used and uh, we can produce. So this was a um, uh, was a first time report that uh, that you can multiply macadamia in this way. These are the plants uh, growing in the glasshouse conditions uh, too and then we um, we did genetic fingerprinting to make sure these are the two clones of the tree. So in case of, so we have another program on the glass biotechnology where, um, where we focus on making, uh, uh, making better quality, uh, quality of the grass. Um, as you most of you know, the grass pollen causes um, allergy, and these allergens are in the pollen, and they are abundant during summer and uh, spring season. Uh, and this um, doesn't stop when you suffer from pollen allergy. Now it's well established that after some time, you also get cross reactivity to your favorite fruit and vegetables. There are a number of patients we screen that, uh, that people, uh, and it's well established in, in, in Europe and birch tree pollen, uh, people who suffer from uh, these pollen allergy, they get cross reactivity or cross, they start, they cannot eat now anymore apples or some people get uh, allergic to, um, uh, to carrots, uh, peaches, uh, melons. Uh, so they develop further cross reactivity. So we, uh, we looked at, um, um, to, and it's not only stopped there and, um, and the, now we know that even cow dairy farming, which, which we do in, uh, in, uh, in Victoria, that uh, dairy cows also suffer from pollen allergy and their uh, milk production becomes reduced. So we collaborated uh, with, the, with the two industries, Valley Seeds and also Hong Kong Jockey Club, uh, which I don't have time to go through that project, but I will give you a glimpse of uh, our collaboration uh, with the Valley Seeds um, uh, on the grass pollen allergy project. So our lab um, identified the major two allergens which cause the most problems in the people. And uh, we set to uh, ask the question, research fundamental research question, can we switch off the allergen um, and we can we switch off the production of one of the major allergen and can still produce viable plant. Uh, for this, um, um, we had to develop the whole technology of inserting the gene into rye grass, uh, perennial rye grass, which is a commercial cultivar of valley seeds, one of the few of their, uh, their cultivars. And we developed the technology of uh, transforming dry grass and producing the genetically modified plant with the pollen, uh, uh, with the reduction, with the switching of the pollen allergen gene in the pollen. And we did this by isolating uh, the pollen specific promoter and linking so that it's a site specific inhibition uh, in the pollen itself. And this is one of the genetically modified dry grass showing normal anthrodehiscence, which I showed you is very important for the plant to propagate, uh, to produce next generation that uh, anther produces pollen and makes the seeds. So <laughs> just to share, um, this was the first report um, uh, showing that you one can switch off the genes in the plant. 
This is the section through the anther of the transgenic plant. Um, and this is our normal wild type plant section, uh, anther section. As you see, this is the immunocyto immunolocalization showing the production of the, uh, of the major allergen in the anther. And that is the transgenic uh, anther uh, showing devote of this uh, immunoreactive uh, protein, which is our allergen, uh, low P5B, uh, one of the allergen, major allergen we targeted. So whether this is translate to actually reduction of the allergy problem in the people, the answer is yes. Here are the seven different, we use the panel showing seven different people who suffered from pollen allergy. This is our um, control, um, their serum, and this is serum against the, uh, the transgenic pollen. As you will see, that overall allergenicity uh, has decreased. So um, I'm going to now switch a little bit to more on legume biotechnology area in our lab. Here, our focus has been uh, to, uh, to understand the molecular basis of floral transition in soya bean. You will ask me why soya bean? Uh, as I shown you in my earlier slides, firstly, soya bean is one of the major crop uh, around the world. Uh, in Australia, we do not grow that much soya bean, but it is taking off. We are increasing more and more production in Australia. But uh, because it's a major legume crop, it uses, it fixes itself uh, nitrogen. So it does not require too much fertilizer. So we need to solve uh, our uh, um, climate uh, problem by using less, um, uh, uh, using less fertilizers and um, re reducing the climate footprint uh, by using less uh, fertilizer associated with that. So soya bean, is a major crop. Um, a, a, this uh, crop is used, provides more than 50% uh, of the worldwide oil seed production. Um, and it's used, as you know, both human and animal feed. And uh, these days, all the uh, focus on the plant protein and the soya bean provides the, uh, the uh, soya bean provides one of the major rich source of that plant protein. Tofu uh, to soya milk you must have seen in the supermarkets. Um, so uh, soya bean is one of the main uh, crops which is used for plant proteins as well. Now, uh, but there is a, 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 a soya bean. Um, what we use is we use most of it is the seed, the seed, seed yield, and which is result of flowering. So, but the flowering, uh, the soya bean is very uh, fussy crop, you can say, and, and the cultivars are uh, divided into different maturity groups. Um, there are 13 different maturity groups. The one which are early maturing maturity groups, they produce less yield. The, the maturity groups, which are late maturing, they produce more yield and they're more agronomically um, uh, important varieties as compared to early maturing varieties. But for our climate change reason, we, uh, the objective is to can we uh, convert late maturing varieties to early maturing varieties because the agronomically these varieties are much, much better to satisfy this seed yield as compared to our early maturing varieties. So, uh, so we, um, uh, uh, our, uh, uh, our objective for this was that can we um, can we discover how this transition from vegetative to floral stage happens uh, in case of soya bean? If we understand that, then perhaps we have a chance uh, to meet our objective of converting uh, uh, early maturing variety with good yield and more control of flowering. So our work um, uh, has been um, looking at the shoot apical meristem of of the soya bean, that's where the action, flowering action takes place. So these are the 10 day old soya bean seedling, and this is the shoot apical meristem 
hand leaf freshly dissected meristem. And that's a whole our work. And I'm so grateful for all my staff and students um, to be able to dissect thousands within one hour of this freshly dissected meristem because we are understanding what we want to understand what happens when it goes uh, through this transition stage from flowering to from vegetative to floral stage and so that we can find some noble components and networks we did find a number of noble components but before we test um, our hypothesis um, we need to first be able to transform or regenerate these commercial varieties um, where we know that uh, uh, for using now new technology like CRISPR technology, the bottleneck is um, can we regenerate uh, these commercial varieties. So we developed this technology that way we can take developing seeds, embryos, and we can produce, we can culture and produce lots of embryos from one embryo. These are the embryos on the top of one embryo, and then each of them has a, a, can give rise to independent plant. Um, so in this way, if, if this is the biggest bottleneck for using the new technology, CRISPR technology, if we cannot uh, regenerate plant, um, then this CRISPR technology is no use for crop plants. So we developed uh, the soybean transformation system. Um, for not for the easy varieties, which are early maturing, but the late varieties. This is the one of the commercial varieties, Bragg variety, where um, my PhD student Sang um, did quite a lot of work to developing uh, that uh, of the transformation of, of these very hard to work with uh, varieties showing, these are the plants showing GFP expression, uh, showing they are transgenic. So, um, and now I want to focus a little bit, show you the example of all these uh, techniques which we will be developing. We were developing in, for legume plants, especially for soya bean. Um, what, uh, as a one example, what has come out? There are a number of examples which we don't have um, time to share, but one very recently published paper, I thought, which made at the, um, at the front of uh, Food and Energy Security Journal. It's a quite a good journal. Um, and and uh, where uh, we showed that we can accelerate the reproductive phase transition in soya bean by manipulating a transcription factor. And uh, we made this plant. This is, uh, this is again, uh, one of the commercial variety. When they grow in the field, they are long, hard to harvest, um, easy to break. Um, so we have converted this uh, uh, variety into a more compact variety um, and early flowering variety. And this is work of um, Hina Arya and the PhD student who just completed her PhD. So um, where does this transcription factor act? This is a general scheme of flowering that soya, uh, soya bean uh, vegetative stage uh, plants senses the environmental signal as well as the internal, how old it is. All these signals inputs are, uh, are counted by a circadian clock in the, in, in the plant and which takes account. And then the floral stimulation happen. When the st floral stimulation happen, this vegetative meristem uh, converts into the flowering meristem and the floral organ formation uh, occurs. And when this occurs, the flowering happen, of course, then the seed set can happen. So this PIF, transcription factor, which um, he now worked on it, um, acts on um, knowing the environmental inputs um, into the plant. Um, and uh, as you know, um, soya bean is a polyploid plant, means the genome has been multiplied a uh, number of times. Some places uh, double the, uh, the numbers, other places um, uh, uh, more multiplication of the genome has happened during evolution. So it's not easy. Uh, she worked quite hard to figure out um, there are seven copies of this transcription factor exist, but which one is connected to the flowering and which one is playing the important role. So she 
Uh, uh, she did a number of experiments, which we do not have time to go through and figure out which one um, is the main, um, um, which can affect the flowering pathway that she named it 4B. So here are these compact uh, uh, traits of this, um, uh, of compact plants. And so by overexpressing these transcription factors, um, uh, we have changed the both vegetative and the reproductive characters of these plants. Uh, uh, this, especially the leaf surface area was reduced so that plant can put more energy, not making veget uh, vegetative stage, but to, uh, go, but to go into the reproductive stage. So number of the days, so it has become a leaf flowering uh, plant and it also matures faster. So it's flowering is one thing, but the farmer wants to collect the seeds. Farmer wants uh, that it should mature before um, sudden change in weather happens or, or whatever the conditions are. But there was no effect on, uh, in the pots or, or the yield or seed yield in these plants. One more important thing about soya bean is the varieties, which are agronomically important varieties. They are very fussy. Uh, if the weather is good, uh, the input is good, they go to flowering. And if there is a suboptimal weather or suboptimal light condition, they go back to the vegetative stage. So um, when they go back to the vegetative state, it means uh, the yield will going to get reduced, um, as well as when this kind of weather conditions happen, they, the, the flower abscission also happen. That, what does it mean? Flower falls and, uh, and the pod the development does not occur or sometimes pods do not develop fully. So these are the photos uh, showing the normal variety and this is the where the before expression over expression happened, as you can see, we disturbed, uh, we provided the suboptimal photo, uh, photo period conditions. And you can see uh, these parts are developing very well. And here is the quantitative data showing that these lines produce much better yield uh, in suboptimal condition as compared to, um, to the wild type control. So, so these are plants are not only compact, that we can grow more plants in the same area, they produce the same yield, and they can grow um, uh, better in suboptical conditions as well. This work also demonstrated because the breeder in, in soybean breeding, uh, breeder use phenotype, phenotypic markers to breed varieties. One of the uh, character we observed that this, um, uh, the pod color it changes to purple, uh, purple color, which usually used in soya bean breeding as a marker, as well as um, uh, the seed, the, the color of the helium. Helium is the, where the pod in the seed are, where the seed absorbs the water uh, for germination. This is also used as a, as a breeding marker uh, and uh, soya bean, is classified uh, into different uses by based on these markers. So this also gave us uh, some markers to breed for uh, for future uh, for future breeding programs. So uh, there are uh, our recent uh, pursued article on our our work. Um, uh, so uh, this. Uh, was the latest on uh, smaller plants, and I hope you'll take time to read uh, these uh, these articles. Um, and uh, I uh, I will finish here to take some questions. And uh, this is an acknowledgement slide, which is the most important slide, which I could not fit all the people in our lab who worked very extensively. Uh, so I'm very fortunate and privileged to work with the number of um, uh, good staff and students, and uh, I'm very grateful for their work and the collaboration we had within Australia as well as overseas, our collaborator. So without much delay, I'm happy to take some more questions. Great, thank you, Prem, for that really interesting talk. Um, maybe you want to stop sharing your screen now and we'll take questions. I invite everybody to put questions in the in the Q&A uh, and not the chat. Um, 
So if you can, while you're thinking about questions, maybe I'll I'll start. Um, Prem, can you stop sharing the screen, Pat? Yeah, yeah, I'm trying. Sorry. Oh, okay. All right. I don't yeah. know why. It is. I just don't. Sorry. That's all right. No the problem. pointer, laser pointer was not working. Ah, okay. All right. Sorry. Um, Prem, let me ask you about the last thing you were talking about in the soybeans. And um, yeah, I, I was intrigued that you found this transcription factor, or if I remember, I think you called it TIF4B, yes. that, that controls the transition from the vegetative meristems to the floral meristems. And, and, um, and, and this is related to photo period. And, and, and I can see that you've developed these plants that are, are more compact and they, uh, and they have a, um, a shorter period of growth before they start to flower. Um, but I'm think, sat here thinking as a biologist, you know, the plants have actually evolved to have a long period of time before it flowers. What, what's the advantage to the plant of having a long period of time before it flowers? Because that's how it had evolved. And then okay. you've changed it so that it now has a short period. And you know, oh. is there any is there any repercussion for the plant, therefore, of having a short period before it flowers? Um, uh, I should have explained a little bit better in this area uh, that soya bean uh, um, plant to go to transition to flowering requires the shorter day length. It's the day length photo period. Yes, plant requires. Um, uh, which I uh, work, I have couldn't pro pro uh, project on the world that there are micro RNS 156, we study in 172, and you can see these micro RNA controlling the transition. I left that part um, uh, out, and there is a certain level of 156 micro RNA has to decrease in the vegetative phase of the plant. And when 172 micro RNA come, it's, it's well established, then the plant goes to, uh, uh, to the flowering stage. And that is the jubilinity of the plant. The same, the example I gave about the macadamia as well, that exists also in the trees, that they don't flower till at the certain level, um, and the antagonistic effect of these micro RNA and they control number of transcription factors. They control number of pathways as well. So uh, and this, yes, there is a certain level is required. It's like a new uh, um, critical concentration of something is required to make that transition. Yes, to make stock simple and more applicable. Uh, so I left out lots of details <laughs> in, in that. But this PIF uh, for transcription factor actually senses the temperature and the photo period. And then, then when you have got a more sensor in place, the plant senses the meristem, senses the quality of the light, the duration of the light much more efficiently and communicate it further in the pathway to, uh, to stimulate the flowering uh, stimulation. Uh, so that's how our theory is. Of course, there is a lot more work needs to be done. Um, and how, uh, whether the pathway which we think how it affects, we have to do all the uh, immunoprecipitation, all those kind of experiments. And we have to, and other results, which we are very um, exciting result we are getting, which uh, I thought I will run out of time that these plants uh, looks like they are more heat tolerant. But I did not have the whole, full um, story, I thought of, we will run out of the time, they are more heat tolerant. So we are also testing whether these plants need more, less water because they are compact, whether they need less nutrients, uh, whether they are drought tolerant, uh, this kind of work has to still, um, but we were, uh, but it's very um, a good phenotype to have converting a late flowering variety into earlier, if, when we look at the data, it's 10 day difference. 10 days is a lot. People, agronomist farmers tells me that 10 days is a lot of difference. And the harvesting, if the variety is compact, it's more easy to harvest. Um, mm. If the yield is the same, yes. Yeah, um, okay, thanks for that explanation. But there was sort of a, a detailed explanation of the biochemistry of it. But what, what would be the advantage to the actual plant of flowering late as opposed to flowering early? Because clearly these plants that flower late have been selected in nature to flower late. So what, I, I don't quite get what the advantage is if they could flower early. Um, um, advantage to the farmer flower early is so that farmer does not have to grow a crop for that long to look after. 
the crop if the yield is the same. Yeah, no, I can see the advantage of the farmer, but why, why have the plants evolved to flower late, the other ones? Um, wild plant evolved, uh, there is a wild germplasm we have, there are uh, germplasm uh, in evolution. Uh, it's evolution and we get lots of different types of wild germplasm in soybean. Um, mm. um, and it's a ratio of certain factors in the plant which converts the merry stem to the flowering. Otherwise, the stimulation comes from the leaves. It does not come. Uh, it, it's the networks, how they evolved. So it's a complex question why uh, plants evolved. Yes, um, plants, uh, I can answer one way. Um, when plants have a shade phenotype, like when plants uh, are under stress, they, they, they tend to flower and complete their life cycle. When the plants are uh, grow in an optimal condition, they usually grow more, lots, lots, lots of vegetable and it out the vegetation stage. But also it's the function of nutrition. If you put more nitrogen uh, uh, or urea, the plants will go very big and will grow lots of vegetation, the vegetative stage. To convert it to the, uh, to the flowering stage, you need to apply potassium and phosphorus. And so it, it's a, it's a, plants are quite complex. You need more than one ingredient to get it right. Not one is not enough. Yes. Okay. Um, can I encourage um, the audience to put any questions if they have them in the Q&A? And meanwhile, um, I had another question for you, Prem, and, and that was about your, um, I think you called it LOP5 allergen in ryegrass. Yes. Um, yeah, and, and I know I know the um, the success of that and the being able to engineer that out of the ryegrass. Um, but did that have any consequences for the grass when you actually when you actually got rid of that particular that particular protein that was um, in the pollen? Uh, yes. So this um, allergen, there are two main allergen. One is called LOP1 and one is called LOP5. Uh, we targeted LOP5 because it's more allergenic and cross-reactive between people, though LOP1 exists in the cytoplasm, this exists in the starch granules. So uh, these, this LOP5 is the one, it's in the starch granule when the thunderstorm comes, the pollen bursts up and people get asthmatic attack. And that is one reason why we targeted this one. And uh, we do not know what is its function in oh, the plant. Okay. And when I have not shown those photos, when we did the pollination um, studies, we used the wild type stigma with the, with the, this pollen and they can germinate the seeds, uh, the pollen tubes can germinate and fertilize. We did all this experiment in, uh, uh, to demonstrate that we could not find the plant function of this lopi 5 Same, that's also, I, I was I mean, very interested to look at the Australian native grasses that whether the evolution of these allergens, how the evolution of these allergens has happened. LOP1 is, seems to be, this LOP5 is more specific to that class of grasses. Some of the grasses we find in the Australian natives, which they do not have LOP5 allergen. Okay. Uh, so LOP1 allergens function is more um, challenging. It's an extensin protein. It's a cell wall protein, but we have found the way to make non-allergenic uh, uh, plant for that as well. And, and did you have a chance to work with immunologists and find out why those particular proteins are particularly allergenic? In other words, why do they? Yes, why, why do they yes, I think so. Mohan is going to talk to in his talk. <laughs> oh, okay. All yes. right. It's a, that's why I just cover the bottom area of our portfolio and he's going to cover uh, the pollen allergy as well as all that. We had a big collaboration um, in my um, slide. We, uh, I think so. I forgot. I couldn't fit in all these things. Uh, the, our collaborator from Melbourne, but main our collaborator have been from Germany and Austria, um, where we collaborated extensively on because they are empty doctors and they can do all the things which plant people can't do. Mm, okay. All right. Final, final question from me, and then I think we'll uh, have to conclude because we're a bit out of time, or we will be. Um, so Prem, how, 
how common is it now for people to be able to genetically modify crop plants? I know a lot of people work on model organisms and, and botanists have worked on model organisms for years and the crop plants were um, a, a huge challenge relative to modern organisms because of the ploidy issues and, and many other issues. Um, so is it now quite common to be able to genetically modify crop plants in the way that you've shown us you can do? Um, it, it still, it is hard, but it's more getting used to people realizing that we need to put more emphasis on, um, on um, genetically modified. It's, it's uh, also the varieties, or the commercial varieties, which are more challenging. To some reason, um, because the commercial varieties we've been selecting for the aid, and there are other characters which uh, which we meant to consider, uh, but it is getting more people. Uh, and not so many labs uh, works on this area because it's very challenging. It takes long time, a lot of patience. People like to publish their paper in a model plant, <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it is, and uh, so. The how our system works, the reward of working in commercial variety is very less, as I shown you in this. Um, even the CRISPR technology, you cannot use it unless you work in the commercial cultivars, because how you gonna transfer it? You cannot transfer. You can still transfer the GM crops, which, we, which is available these days. As you know, we extensively now GM crops are grown. So I've been corn um, and cotton and canola. There are four major crops. They been uh, transformed first kind of a, a model variety. Then they bred it. Took so many years to breed it into commercial varieties. But the if you want to use the CRISPR technology, actually and make crop plants to meet your requirement, you can now delete, add DNA, as you know, you can modify, but it has to be done in the commercial varieties. So it's a lot of US companies work on the commercial cultivars, but in the academic world, people try to shy it away because it takes lots to get the system working and then, um, and how do you then convince the funding bodies that this is the worth doing rather than just uh, looking something in a rabbit of six? Well, Prem, it's important work and you can see the direct application to agriculture, which is not so immediately obvious from the, um, uh, from the model plants such as Arabidopsis and things. So um, great that uh, you've been able to establish it. And thank you very much for telling us about it. Um, no. So um, thanks, Prem, and I'm going to close by um, reminding everybody that we uh, are going to have the next seminar on the 10th of May. And Professor James Hunt, who's a new professor of agronomy, will present his research on increasing Australian wheat yields, um, past successes and prospects for future improvement. Um, so from um, Prem's work on uh, genetic modification of crops, uh, James is going to tell us about Australian wheat yields. Uh, and so until next time, um, thanks very much for joining me today. And thank you particularly to Prem for telling us about your work, Prem. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And thank you very much, John, for hosting. I appreciated that. And it was my pleasure to share some of our work. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. Bye. Thanks. Bye.